My background, I spent 10 years in New York City for the Staten Island Advance, uh, working with the Staten Island Advance. I was the bureau chief for the Advance at uh, the police department, at New York Police Department, uh, One Police Plaza for three years. And then they moved me over to federal court, uh, Bro Brooklyn and Manhattan, both the Eastern District and the Southern District Federal Court, and uh, did a lot of um, organized crime work. Uh, did, c covered a lot of mob trials out there. And I was in here at Augie's, and this was probably last, I would say last June or so, last June, July. I was just in here hanging out. And Augie showed me this newspaper headline from the Detroit Evening Star, I believe, um, that said, "My gangsters bomb killed Rockney or blew up Rockney plane and, uh, or something like that. And it was a headline, and it was this article from January 6, 1933. And I read this article, and it was about, and the whole article stated that, a, according to the South Bend News Times, a story from the old South Bend News Times, that they had an unimpeach unimpeachable source, quote unquote, okay. who uh, said that the Secret Service was investigating um, uh, that the that a bomb had been set in a mail that had been planted in a mail pouch by a member of Al Capone's gang in retaliation for a Notre Dame priest, Father John Reynolds, and they named Father Reynolds in the article, who had testified in a trial, in the trial of Leo Brothers, in a murder trial of Leo Brothers, who was tried and convicted of killing the Chicago Tribune reporter Jake Lingle on June 9th, 1930, in a mob, it, it was a mob hit. Lingo was a Chicago Tribune reporter, but he was also a bag man for Capone. Anyway, I found out, come to find, and the article also said, Father Reynolds had swapped his plane ticket with Rockney the day after he got off the witness stand. And three days later, the plane blew up. Now, Rockney was heading out to Los Angeles to be a consultant on the film, The Spirit of Notre Dame. Yes. Rockney had uh, that we, earlier that week. Rockney had come home from um, from a Florida vacation to uh, spring football practice. It just well, this was like around this time of year. Mm -hmm. you know, and um, spring football practice had just begun. During that week, he got a call from his agent, Christy Walsh, and uh, Walsh said, "Hey, you've got a, you know I've got an offer on the table, fifty thousand dollar offer on the table for you to go to L.A. and be a consultant on this film, The Spirit of Notre Dame." But he says, you got to get out there next week. They, they, they want to see you as soon as possible. Well, Father Reynolds was busy with the trial. He couldn't leave. Well, Rock, uh, back up for a second. Rock, he couldn't find a plane ticket at the last minute. He was having a hard time finding a plane ticket. So he's walking. Uh, that Saturday, he's walking across campus, and he runs into Father Reynolds. And Father Reynolds had to stay. The, the trial was still going on. And Brothers wasn't convinced. The, the trial didn't end until after the crash, like a couple of days after the crash. Well, anyway, Father Reynolds said, I got to stay here. I have a ticket to, you know, get out of town and go out there, but I have to stay here because I can't leave for the trial. And also, I have to, he was a, he was an American history professor and he had to be back in school the following week. He had to be back in class the following week when, when students came back. So he gives his ticket to Rodney. I started piecing together not only that story, but I got a copy of the U.S. Department of Commerce's official crash investigation report okay. that said the plane was delayed for 45 minutes to wait for a late postal, uh, to wait for a late, late uh, mail shipment. Mm -hmm. And there was 95 pounds of mail that they put in this plane. <laughs> you know, and uh, that they came to this plane late. Also, I found out, and this was also in the investigation report, that the mechanic on that plane said he had grounded the plane for structural safety issues, but that he was overruled by a TWA supervisor um, uh, to put the plane in the air because they needed the plane to go. Um, his re reasoning was they needed the plane, the plane to get up in the air and deliver the mail. And I have a theory about that. I believe once the January 6, 1933 stories, which was first run in the South Bend News Times, I believe that the reason why that story, because that, that story was all over the country. That headline was all over the country. It was in newspapers all over the country. But here's the deal. They were two years, the country was two years removed from the Rockney crash, from Rockney's death. 1931. Right, exactly. Yeah. So you had, I, I think the grieving for Rockney had been, well, was over. 
This story came out in 1933. They didn't have social media like we mm -hmm. have today. All they had was radio and newspapers. That's all they had. So the story got in. I believe after that, the story got lost in the height of the Great Depression. Everybody else was had m much more serious concerns than to worry about what killed Newt Rockney mm -hmm. at the time. And I also believe that, that there was um, Hitler's um, rise at the time leading into World War II was also dominating news right. back then. So I think the story just kind of, I just think the story just kind of died. And I will say this. J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI, denied the story. De de completely denied it when they when they went after him. You know, when, when they asked him about it. 